Following on from April Kelleher and Aurelio Diaz's stories, we have Ike Ronson, an SHD agent turned rogue. While many think of rogue agents as bad, the enemy, and evil to the core, there are stories like Ike's that offer a different perspective on these agents, and why some of these agents ended up turning their back on the division. Situated in Long Island, Agent Ike Ronson received a call from Mantis. Checking to make sure Isaac isn't monitoring the call, he tells her to go ahead. Mantis informs Ike of a civilian holding valuable intel who is leaving Manhattan. He is to follow and observe. She is a white female in her early 30s, red brown hair, blue eyes, and approximately 5 foot 7. Her name, April Kelleher. It is believed that she may be on her way to Ann Arbor. Ike confirmed the instructions and signed off to report back in 48 hours. If he was to catch up with her, he needed to depart immediately, but he was currently in the middle of a JTF operation to retake City Hall. His part in this was to watch the flank and alert the main force if neighbouring gangs were to join the attack. He didn't want to leave the JTF and his fellow division agents to be ambushed. He came up with a plan to grab the attention of the gang he was watching and draw their attention onto him where he could lead them away and eventually lose them. After emptying a couple of magazines into a group of them, he disappeared through one of the back doors of the building he'd been hiding in. He could hear the shouting and the return fire coming from the rest of the gang, who had been alerted by his initial bursts. But he wasn't concerned. These were just street thugs. With all his training, he shouldn't have any trouble losing them. But while running through the corridors, he came across a group of civilians, at least a dozen of them, consisting mainly of children. He could hear the gang members coming, but he certainly didn't have enough firepower and ammunition to hold them off. He needed to be leaving the city to catch up with April, but he couldn't just leave the civilians to be gunned down by the gang. Spotting a fire exit, he screamed at the civilians to go, but before they were able to make it very far, they were showered in broken glass. The gang had predicted the direction he would take. Some of the civilians were armed, and charged through the door at the attackers. Turning back at the direction he'd come from, Ike lobbed a couple of grenades down the hall to put a stop to the hostiles who'd been following him. He walked down the hall to clear anyone remaining and made it to the street, where he started making his way south, but not before he called in the incident, saying civilians were under fire and needed support. Ike managed to board a JTF patrol boat, which would take him to the other side of the river, no questions asked, due to his division status. Once back on land, Ike was briefed by a young JTF officer on what had been happening in the area. A group of terrorists had been planning to blow up a bridge that was being used by the JTF as a supply line. Ike needed to leave and make his way to Ann Arbor, but this kid looked to be no older than 18 and well out of his depth. Plus, the countermeasures that Mantis had put in place to stop Isaac marking him as rogue would only go so far. He still needed Isaac to provide his heads-up display. If he didn't assist on a job like this, questions would start being asked. He queried of their approximate whereabouts and requested a few supplies he would need for the mission. Making his way into the surrounding forest area, it wasn't long before he was able to locate the group. Using a night vision scope, he was able to observe them and get an idea of what he was up against. Six tents, 13 people, all white, all male, many of them armed with JTF issue weapons. Although Directive 51 didn't require him to confirm anything, if anything he could just walk up and blast down the lot of them. But this wasn't the sort of person he was. It was at this time that he reflected on what had happened in Manhattan. He hoped that another agent had picked up his distress call and managed to save the civilians. However, he had a situation in front of him that was fairly clear cut. This was a group who had attacked a JTF patrol and stolen a pile of C4 of which they were planning on destroying supply lines of aid being brought into the city. From the cover of darkness, Ike prepared to strike the group of terrorists. Before the first grenade hit the ground, he was throwing the next. Among the explosions, he was popping off shots to any able bodies who were able to stand up. When everything looked clear, he made his way down to the tents. Cautiously walking through, Ike found the C4 
more than enough to blow up a bridge. But then, approaching another tent, he heard the cry of a baby. Its mother had been killed by the shrapnel from one of his grenades. Although less than ideal, he wasn't just going to leave the baby behind. Hiking for three miles, with the baby in his left arm and his M4 on his right shoulder, he made it back to the JTF camp. He instructed the JTF officer that the group had been taken care of and gave the location of the C4. After handing over the baby to the JTF officer, Ike was on his way to Ann Arbor again. Walking through the outskirts of a town called Mackieville, he saw less than a dozen other people. At this time, midnight, in New York, he would have had to be on his toes, coordinating operations through the chaos and violence happening all around him. This was actually the time he was first contacted by Mantis. She was the voice of a new rising power. They saw how the current government was struggling, but had a new way of getting through this and achieving a new America, a better America. Ike lost his girlfriend and child to the virus. His ex-wife and two other children had been murdered by the cleaners in early January. The JTF and the government were unable to protect them, and when someone had something better to offer, he was all for it. He believed in their goals, but at this stage, he knew nothing about them. As it had been 48 hours since his last check-in with Mantis, he received a call. Ike updated her on his position and what he's been doing to keep up his cover. Mantis was also able to provide some intel on April's location, which confirmed he was still slightly ahead of her. It wasn't until Ike made it to Michigan that he heard from Mantis again. She confirmed that April was getting close to Ann Arbor and was heading towards the North Campus at the University of Michigan. Ike had to get ahead of her and meet up before she arrived. He needed a chance to gain her trust so he could find out what intel she had. After arriving in Ann Arbor, Ike checked in with the local JTF outpost to see if anyone going by her description had checked in. He was running through the possible routes she could have been taking to get there, and eventually settled on the fact that she was likely to be coming from the south, so he set forth to start patrolling the area. Eventually he saw a few people gathering in the distance. He was a little far away, but it looked like a woman, possibly matching April's description, was being approached by six men, and the situation was quickly escalating. The woman fired a shotgun towards three of them and started running, but was quickly tackled to the ground. If this was April, he had to act fast. Without a second thought, he closed the gap between them and quickly dispatched the remaining men. April thanks him for saving her life and explained that she was heading for Ann Arbor. Ike introduced himself to her and says that he's heading that way so will join her for the remainder of the journey. Gaining trust from civilians was a fairly easy task for a division agent. By this stage, people recognised and understood the meaning behind the glowing orange circle. They walked more than 40 miles to get there by the end of the day. Being that it was late and that they were exhausted from the day's hike, they decided to get some rest before visiting the labs in the morning. They found an old rooftop cafe to spend the night. Ike set up a fire pit while April dragged over an old couch. April was tired and was starting to fall asleep but was discussing her journey with Ike, who was sitting in a chair on the other side of the fire, when suddenly, they both heard footsteps. Another man, sporting the orange circular glow of a division agent, appeared. Lit up by the light of the fire, the agent introduced himself as Aurelio Diaz. Ike was concerned by this agent's sudden appearance. Was he aware of what happened back in Manhattan, where he was forced to leave civilians behind in a firefight? But before he could pry into Diaz's reason for being there, April started telling the story of how she and Ike met on the road to Ann Arbor. She then went on to tell them the full reason of why she was making this journey, and about the broad spectrum antivirals that were being produced in the labs she was to visit the next day. So that was it, Ike thought. This was the reason Mantis had him following her. Mantis and her organization would need these antivirals if they were to build this new America. Ike awoke early, just before dawn. He was half expecting April and Diaz to be gone, but she was still asleep on the couch and Diaz was standing up, leaning against the deck railing. 
Ike had the urge to explain his actions in Manhattan, but he knew he had no way of making him understand, let alone the reasons behind his allegiance towards Mantis' organization. But Ike still felt he had made the right decision. The JTF were incapable of looking after the people in their care, and if there was truly a cure to the dollar flu, it should be handled by people who know what they were doing. Ike excused himself to go to the bathroom. It had nearly been 48 hours since his last contact with Mantis. When he was out of earshot from Diaz in April, he called in. Watching the stairway behind him, Ike told Mantis of what he had learned, that there is an antiviral being worked on at the North Campus. Mantis confirmed and said that there is a team en route to extract him and the product. But Ike knew he couldn't risk exposure at this moment. They only had one shot at this. He told her to hold off until he'd seen the product with his own eyes. Instead, the team should move into place outside of Ann Arbor and execute once he'd confirmed. The three of them made their way to the labs and managed to find one of the professors in charge. She confirmed she had worked in a team with Bill Kelleher, April's husband. She went on to tell them how shortly after the outbreak, officials placed priority on keeping the facility secure so they could continue their work. They managed to create a batch composed of 24 doses of the antivirals and that they had been sent to an advisor of the president in Washington, D.C. It was at that moment that Agent Diaz had received a call in his earpiece and went out into the hall to answer it, while April continued to get answers to her questions relating to her husband. After a few minutes, Diaz returned. Then casually, he pivoted towards Ike and knocked him out cold with a left hook. While tying him to a chair, he would go on to explain why. Diaz tells April the full story, that Ike was an agent stationed in New York, and he had left three days after April had, under orders from an unknown organization, that he is a double agent, that he has gone rogue. He was under specific orders to find April, and that he has been tracking him ever since he abandoned the civilians in New York, leaving them to die. The call he just received told him that Ike had just ordered a strike on this facility and that they will be here any minute. This caused the professor to run from the room so she could inform the local JTF who were guarding the compound. Ike started to come to. He explained how he was approached by a group, how they confirmed what he was already feeling at the time, that the government and the JTF were incapable of restoring order to the country, that it was time for someone else to step in and fix things. It was about this time that they could hear the sound of helicopters approaching. Ike went on to say that they better move fast. A couple of weeks from now, they will be seizing control of the fuel supplies up and down the east coast. As whoever controls the fuel, controls the vehicles. And it would be the vehicles that would decide the outcome of the upcoming war. Leaving Ike tied to the chair, Diaz and April evacuated the building, attempting to find a way of escaping the facility. With Black Hawks approaching, it was obvious that the JTF had no chance of holding off this attack. They were outnumbered and outgunned. And this is the last we hear of Ike Ronson. In case you hadn't guessed it by now, this story is heavily based on the Broken Dawn novel, which is the sequel to the New York Collapse. If you haven't read either of these books, I strongly urge you to. They're fantastic, and they really go into the details of what happened and what it was like during the early stages of the outbreak. They're a really cool addition to the story, with depth that cannot be found anywhere else. These videos are really just scratching the surface. If you're new to the channel, I have a number of other videos on April's story. I'll link these in the description. If I didn't think I was going to get struck in some way, I'd probably make some sort of audiobook series on the novels. But I'm not really sure of the legality around that sort of thing. Anyway, thank you very much for watching, I hope you've enjoyed this, and I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers!